Hey, this is Vishal Krishna, the founder and editor of the UpstreamLife.com. I love technology and I love EY, or now it's called EY more so. I have somebody from EY GDS and Mr. Raghu Rajaram. How are you, Raghu? Fantastic. How are you? I'm very good. I want to know what you do at uh, EY GDS. I run cloud consulting services for EY. I also run the financial services sector for global delivery services. So, what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk AI transformative power of uh, technologies uh, for you wonderful companies out there. We're also going to talk much more. We're going to talk security, cloud. What else are we going to talk about? We are going to talk about Gen AI, I guess, because that's yes. the talk of the town. Yes, and yeah. how you can embrace it. Embrace it and uh, remove the uncertainty and the fear in people's minds. Yes. And also talk about culture. And we're going to talk about health and wellness, which is very important to you and why EY is a great place for you to work. Right, Raghu? Absolutely. Yep. Enjoy it. Send me questions. I'll get them to answer it for you. Thank you. Thank you. Raghu, thanks for being on the podcast. It's always good to meet somebody from EY and Absolutely. EY GDS more so. Huh. For the audience, quick history of uh, EY GDS. I know it's a huge organization yep. globally. Yep, yep, yep. So EY is uh, EY GDS is a global delivery services. And I say GDS, a lot of be the global delivery services. It's a syndicate within the broader mm -hmm. confines of EY. So it, in GDS, we provide the entire strategy to end-to-end -end delivery for our clients. So it's so our clients are global, yes. so GDS is global. Wherever our clients are, we are, and we serve them globally. And we serve today close to 2,500 plus clients right across all sectors, right from financial services to media and telecom, to customer, to health care and mining, to everything that you can name off, right? So our clients are, wherever our EY branches are and the clients are, we, we help them sell. Right? And uh, we, we provide end-to-end -end services. Mm -hmm. Well, you would know probably from the past that like EY is very strong in tax and accounting. We realized it as the world is trending towards a lot more technology and consulting. So by uh, 2011, uh, we made a conscious effort in terms of how do we pivot into consulting. So we made a massive investments towards that and have significantly grown the organizations towards it. Today, we have a very, very strong uh, business consulting organization, technology consulting organization. When we say consulting, what it really means is not just giving them, we have a client a blueprint or a roadmap, but also hand-holding them towards execution until they see the actual results. So we've been very uh, curated. We provide curated services to our clients and delivering them to one value proposition for them. Okay, you had made a statement. You're a company that helps everybody from the boardroom to the server. Room. Correct, yeah. Uh, how true is that? Do you want to well, give us a color on that? Absolutely, spot on. So as, you know, it, it, we have a very strong C-suit presence, right? So some of you take a look at uh, EY is a platform for uh, or a person to become to C-suit. So if you see a lot of EY alumni, they are currently in the C-suits of large organizations. So when they are sitting in that spot, and if you are in a C-suit, particularly in the top of the mountain, you are alone, you really want somebody who you trust. So they come back to EY and say, hey, how can you help us? So we, our access to C-suit is fantastic. So we take uh, leverage that actually and bring the entire, handhold them towards the entire server room conversation. So right from the C-suit, help them define the strategy, define the transformative agenda, taking them through how do you actually program management, the entire thing in a, in a military style fashion, and then do the design architecture, implementation, testing, hypercare, the entire soup to nuts, right? That's, that's where it is. And it's, a found it, it's founded on the trust that these guys have on us, right? So that's why I say it's a boardroom to a server room conversation and our impact is stretched across. Because when you embark on a transformation program, it touches every aspect of your value chain. You want an organization which understands the business, which understands the regulatory and the compliance side of it, which understands the tech, has the technology chops. It does know how to get stuff done. And organizations such as large transformations, there are different types of people, right? So there are business, technology, operations, each one of them have different agenda. You want a body like EY to come and like, you know, provide the consultative value to business, talk to the technology in terms of the business outcomes and deliver it, right? The ability to execute is our strong source. Raghu, this is, you've given me such knowledge that I want to talk about, uh, you know, the fact that transformation happens with consent. And and you said firms can, in, in, you know, do tr transformative services. But what happens is if they don't build the right uh, compliance mechanisms, okay. they're going to lose out in the long run. So how do you balance the best of tech and compliance at the same time at uh, EY? Absolutely. I mean, technology is exciting stuff for mm -hmm. most of us. And in the, the race to provide a niche differentiated proposition sometimes okay. people overlook the compliance aspect mm -hmm. of it. And the last thing that you would want is 
you being the front page of like say Hindu yeah. India yeah. or New York Times yes. or in the Americas, right? So you don't want to be in that and for all the bad reasons. Mm-hmm. So it's very important to look at it from a perspective of what is the right thing to do, mm-hmm. right? Right thing and comply to the the ways of doing it, right? Mm-hmm. In, a, in a way that we are not stumbling across mm-hmm. anything that's not supposed to be uh, yes. used. For example, customer data mm-hmm. is a core proposition of the entire thing. With, without the customer data, you cannot create anything unique Mm-hmm. Uh, perspective and to customer data you have to get a consent from the customer and consumer to say hey can I actually use your data to create intel out of it or insights out of it so we have a very strong compliance organization a regulatory organization which ensures that like none of those when we do a transformation program none of those are breached or overlooked yes. and that is included not towards the far end of the overall process that while you're doing your yeah. testing you're realizing oh my god you're not supposed to do this but rather towards the start of the entire process itself right so we bring them up and it's a forethought so compliance and regulatory is a forethought and it's brought to towards the far left of the conversation so it's baked into the entire model and the design and engineering and delivery that's fascinating so that builds trust Correct. That means long-term vision. And on top of that, you know, cloud computing is central to all this. I want you to talk about your organization as well, where even security becomes very important, absolutely. right, while building this trust. Do you want to talk about your organization? Sure, absolutely. So I lead cloud for EY mm-hmm. today, cloud consulting services for EY. We serve close to like 500 plus clients and we have done tremendous amount of cloud mm-hmm. transformations. So the key is cloud is the backbone of any transformation today. Without cloud, there is no modernization. Right, mm-hmm. and cloud becomes the bedrock. So, if you're building something new or a new architecture, a new design, it is built cloud native. Yeah. So, if we are starting greenfield into an organization producing all this, uh, you know, systems, you would go directly into cloud. That's called the cloud first and cloud cloud first strategy, which yes. we help a lot. But that's only part of a very small proponent of the entire transformation. Today, if you look at it, for the last couple of decades, clients have invested a tremendous amount of legacy. Right, yes. which is legacy. And by the way, like whatever you do today is legacy tomorrow. Okay. So whatever they've done is the right thing at that point in time. But age is, you know, tech has moved yes. on. Right? So we are helping all of them unclutter those applications, yes. the data, bring in all the data together, unclutter those applications and help them move towards cloud because cloud not only it helps from a cost perspective, which majority of them think it's going to offer a cost, right? But it gives you a balanced cost perspective, but it gives you the agility, it gives you the innovation, it gives you the reach and the penetration into your customer market, right? So when you're operating in cloud as a cloud native, you get access to all of those. It's like you running on a treadmill, standing on a treadmill. Some of them stand on the treadmill. Yes. They're going to slip and fall. You got to be at the pace of the treadmill. That's how the technology industry is today, the business industry is today. It's moving so fast. If you are an organization which is not actually moving at the same pace, in the, like in the way of a treadmill analogy, you're going to slip in fast. How you get, yeah. You're going to be get it enough. And, right? and in the so. cloud, it's no longer a storage conversation. It's more of a compute conversation. Isn't so, it? Right. Correct. So from a cloud, I mean, as a general user out there, we all like, you know, we store our stuff in cloud, right? From iPhone to Android, we just put it in cloud. That's the general aspect of how people use cloud for but it's 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 used in pretty much in every capacity it's about how in the compute side and network side that is the founder you know uh, like for example if you're using your gmail account mm-hmm. you're sitting on google cloud, yes right it's a SaaS product mm-hmm. but you, you're not installing some gmail into your yeah. laptop it is offered to you as a service so it is a fulfillment business. I mean, initially, Amazons of the world went into the fulfillment business. It's a mental model shift. I don't have to own everything. I can rent it, and I can use it whenever I want. So it's about moving from a typical CapEx-based model to an OPEX-based yes. model. CapEx, like capital expenditure to op- operating it's expenditure. A giant. So that way, like yeah. you, are, you are only using it as much as you need as you go, and you pay as you go, right? That is actually a help in a, a very long run in terms of Gives you that independence, ability to move fast, yeah. ability to invest, break barriers, all those aspects. Okay. Helps a lot. I want to cover your journey because your journey also encompasses how the world is moving towards cloud. Mm-hmm. Today, some of the organizations that I talk to talk about hybrid clouds, multi-cloud environments, mm-hmm. AI in the cloud. Mm-hmm. We're going to get into AI. We haven't even Correct. got there yet. Correct. Uh, in 2018, these conversations were just starting, right? Correct. How have they changed? Uh, how have organizations realized that, okay, we have, we can protect our data. Uh, yes, we can move workloads to the cloud. Mm-hmm. 
uh, we can orchestrate cloud environments mm -hmm. right from within mm -hmm. our central mm -hmm. servers. Mm -hmm. How how are they managing all this? Let's say the Fortune 500, because that's Correct. the ones that you Correct. work with. Those are the ones so, you work with, right? Correct. So still, while I would say while cloud has been there for a while now, uh, still there are a lot of companies who have not moved into cloud the entire time. Uh, in cloud, you have public cloud and private yes. cloud and hybrid cloud. At a simplistic level. At the simplistic level. Yes. Public cloud, there are organizations which can actually go 100% public cloud mm -hmm. because they don't own certain mm -hmm. data. They have the independence to yes. operate in a public cloud setting. Like, for example, if you're a music industry, let's say you're Spotify. Streaming. Spotify, streamings of the world. I mean, you can just operate in a public yes. cloud. But if you're a bank, you can't compare Spotify to, let's say, a bank out yeah, there, right? Not. So you the got, compliance comes in yeah, again. Yeah, you got a whole lot. You're sitting on a lot of regulatory data. And you, you have to think consciously about, like, what is that actually I can do in cloud, right? So this is where striking a balance between what can I do on my prem versus or what can I do in public cloud. Mm -hmm. This is where hybrid cloud was born, right? And even today, all the hyperscalers who were like AWS, Google, Amazon, uh, everybody, mm -hmm. they also have a pr private cloud setup. They can bring in the power of cloud to your own premises mm -hmm. and data centers as well. So they offer this the balance between what you can do, right, where you would want to use like the power of cloud from an elasticity and scalability standpoint, as well as how you can use the, you can still be compliant to your regulators, right? Mm -hmm. So that is where the majority of the companies are. So it depends upon the industry. So if you look at the financial services industry, if you look at the government, if you look at the healthcare, like HIPAA regulations yeah. are there, they are, they are actually, I wouldn't say they're slow to cloud, that would put them on a negative side. I would say they're very cautious about how they, and they're making a reasonable judgment in terms of how they move towards cloud. And they're all operating in cloud as well. So they're moving one workload at a time. It's like horses for the courses. Right? Yeah. So choosing what workload needs to go into, into cloud and they are stepping towards it. While there are industries, like the streaming industry, as uh, said, there are like, you know, hardware industry, whatnot, like the media industry, they can do, they can go really fast into the public cloud. That's how they've been. I, I want to talk about the media industry. It's close to my heart, right? <clears throat> so, typically today, media organizations themselves are being disrupted. Uh, there's conversations, everything is about the amount of data you generate, right? Are they, are they using cloud, are they using cloud compute to create data at scale? How do you engage with them, for example? Typically, is it, again, just a storage conversation saying, look, I have mm -hmm. so much content mm -hmm. over the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. Can I archive mm -hmm. it in the cloud? Can I use computing mm -hmm. to pull out those, mm -hmm. uh, you know, those old shows yeah. and create, you know, right. a small run for a season maybe? What are the typical conversations? So I'm just a, throwing this a, in. From a, let's take the streaming industry, yes. right? Um, the, there are pockets. As a streaming industry, you would have drive insights in terms of, hey, I'm going to release a new, new uh, series yes. into my platform. Mm -hmm. We know that, for, and we are going to do a massive campaigning on that. Okay. We know that for the next one month, that's going to be a lot of hits, mm -hmm. right? So during that period of time, if you are operating in cloud, you can scale. You can use the power of cloud to scale in advance. This is the auto-scaling aspect of it. And when the traction goes down, you can descale it back, right? If in a traditional on-prem infrastructure, it's impossible for you to do because it's possible, but you'll be ending up spending a whole lot of money. On CapEx. Right? So that's the piece where we see a lot. Right? In the board, the elasticity aspect of it, media companies use that a lot, but they also need to know that when a lot of these hits happen and the storage increases, they still need to be able to tap into some of the cloud's advantages and storing large amounts of data. Right? Typically, so, how does the conversation start? Do they appreciate that this is the way forward? Yes, they do. The C-suite behavior. Because they're, I mean, not talking about the age, maybe it's a mindset. Hey, is my data going to be right. secure? That's possibly the only thing. Yeah, the CXO. Let's yeah. say it's CXO. The CXO as well have multiple people in the CSO and the agenda is very different, right? So if you have a CEO, they're looking at how I'm going to advance my company. Absolutely. And if it's CFO, they're looking at like, you know, how can I be more optimal and profitable, right, in the entire thing. A COO looking at how do I not embark into any kind of risks and ensure that my deliver things on time and stuff. So each and CTO have a different agenda. CIO. So, have a different so the CEO agenda. wants an advancement. The CTO, yeah. C, C, the CFO maybe on the cost saving. Cost, yeah, cost saving and, and CEO optimization on like you know delivering it on the right Correct. time and that's optimal and being efficient. So each one of them have a different agenda. Right now, cloud touches every aspect of it. So when we go into have a conversation with them. We touch upon how it's going to benefit that particular side of the organization. Yes. 
when when we have a conversation with the CEO, CFO, we're going to talk about like how it's from a capex to opex side of it, how it's going to help them save a lot of money over a long period of time. But that might not uh, inc- entertain the CTO or yeah. the CIO. They're like, okay, how can I release some really uh, cool, stuff. Know, cool stuff for my business, for my business to go actually sell a lot more and appreciative of our business, right? As a technology. It's a different, so again, it's a different horses or courses. Groups. Correct, correct. So, that, so we are having a very different conversation with each parties because end of the day, all of them have to sign up for it. If we embark on a transformation with some parties, not party to it, uh, it is going to make the entire journey very difficult for everybody. So it's, it's this is where UI comes in, where like we have access to all of them, we talk to them, we produce the right business case, we put all of them as a proper stakeholders, and and understand each one of those stakeholders and what is in it for them, right? So what all about what is in it yes. for them, what is in it for the organization, what is in it for a, a common you know and drive the entire thing through success, right? I mean you show the success. Everybody wants to be part of the success story, right? Yes. So they, you can bring in that adoption. You can bring the camaraderie mm. to get things done. Okay. You spoke about 2,500 companies in this ecosystem for you, mm. right? Uh, how many of them would be um, new age companies? Because if cloud, cloud-first cloud companies would mm-hmm. also want to work with the mm-hmm. IEY GDS. Yeah. And for what reasons? Let's say, just for examples, probably a new age startup that's mm-hmm. become a unicorn in the last Correct. eight, nine years. They themselves Correct. will come to an EY saying, can you show us a roadmap, right? Correct, Correct. How so, do you work with that? Uh, apparently, mm-hmm. EY, EY, <laughs> EY has a hundred year plus history, right? And I would have to tell you about UI's uh, transformation as well. Mm-hmm. Why we help transforming um, every client uh, mm-hmm. to a 2,500 plus client that we've done. EY has a hundred plus year old organization, a tax and accounting organization. Today operates 95% age in cloud. Mm-hmm. And we have embarked on you yourself journey, in three years, we ourselves. Mm-hmm. When we went through the transformation, we have learned through the transformation a whole lot of deal. Now, through the learnings, we are actually taking into the organization. So, majority of our clients, by the mix of it and through the history that we carry, are organizations which is rooted in the Fortune 500 or Fortune 1000. So, our clientele, majority of them, uh, are companies which have been there for a long period of time, has tremendous amount of um, you know, uh, trust in the in the ecosystem had been there for a while, and uh, who who serve a lot of customers of their customers. Mm-hmm. There are companies, the the latest of the companies, right, which has come up. The startups, uh, yeah, startups, and uh, and then the startups who have become the mid sized companies mm-hmm. and now large size companies. The tech companies, particularly, they have been huge clients for us mm-hmm. as well, right? So. But they're for cloud you know, first companies. You have to they are cloud, yeah, they're so cloud they know the cloud story very well. And they do this pretty much themselves very well Correct. as well. Correct. So, because they're tech inherently. Ex- exactly, inherently tech. So majority of the companies who work with us are folks who actually wanted help and wanted to help them in a large scale capacity. Uh-huh. Okay. Uh, companies of uh, of that nature, which you are referring to as a startup in a mid size, are are born in the cloud age, hmm. born in the cloud era. And they are rooted from the cloud. While they get us our advice and stuff, they generally get stuff okay. done them by themselves. At what stage would they work with you as well? Maybe capacity is expanding globally, uh, utilizing the technology globally. Yeah. That's when they work with you, perhaps. So that is uh, that that is the shift. It is shifting. Hmm. So twenty years back, when we started, it was a huge cost of it right side of it. And I'm sure that's not just us alone, Correct. but every other GCC in here, you would have heard this cost of it yes. story, right? It is primarily smooth because we are mm-hmm. one by fourth of the cost of wherever it is and depends upon wherever yeah. the global they're operating on. But today, uh, particularly GDS and particularly India, uh, we are already, India is going through this golden age of, uh, we're already in the golden age of it because everybody wants to be in that India story, yeah. growth story. And we can see that from the results and how it's pivoting, mm-hmm. right? And we are we want to be the transformators for everybody. We are the transformation engine. And I can say authoritatively that India particularly has become the transformative engine. For the last 20 years, a lot of different countries have tried in terms of to substitute India, compete with India in different capacity because of whatever reasons, because of the geopolitical tensions, forex reasons and whatnot. India stood very strong when it comes to, so if you want the right capacity, right capability and the right scale at the optimal price, There's no other place other than where we are right now. It's perhaps because of the f- focus on education and training, I'm sure. Absolutely. This is all in making. Mm-hmm. I don't know if it was consciously <laughs> done. That is different discussion. But 
but we all ended up in a good spot, yeah. right? You, you cannot find a better uh, large-scale English-speaking population. Yeah. You can't find people who are energetic and ready to be willing to be nimble to work to put harder. So, so it's great, great you say this because that means EY from India can serve any any position of a company. You can, if it wants, can help a large growth startup. Correct. You can also help a Fortune 500 or a Fortune 2000 as well. Correct. That is that is true because if you, if you look at it, while maybe like I, I, there were like good leaders at that point yes. in time as well, but majority of the workforce were used as, okay, I tell you what to do, you do it. Absolutely. Here, right? But now it has shifted. Now it's all about like how do we together let's solve this problem. Yes. Right? So we are, we're not order takers anymore. We are problem solvers. Right, we together look at it and operate and solve for the problem. Right, so our folks uh, have the swagger now. Yeah. Right, to move around with the with the swagger and say, "Hey, I'm part of this. I'm we're level playing field. You are a stakeholder. I'm a stakeholder. Let's together solve for your end clients." Problem. It's interesting. Right. Is that how you built EY GDS in your organization, Absolutely. 2018? With only 50 people, you said, right? And right. now it's quite large. Yeah. Uh, that inclusivity and this learning from each other, did that help you? Yes, definitely. It's about one, when we entered in the market, we were very careful and thinking about, I'm not going to be uh, everything to everybody. Okay. We wanted to be creating something which is very niche mm -hmm. and where we are, we have the branding for ourselves. So our brand permission allows us to operate in some certain space, but... Other than that specific area, we have to play. We have to be very choosy in terms of like what we play, about strategy and what we not play. Yeah. So we've been very conscious about that effort. We have been very conscious in the way that we, who we will hire. And because everybody, will, when, you're, when you're starting really small and you're growing organically and sometimes inorganically, like from outside and acquisitions, the culture can be disrupted a whole lot. So, so it's you the want same to thing, right? different agendas, you have to create a culture. It's tough. The culture should be our own culture. Mm -hmm. And EY is known for the culture, right? Known for that, the homely, friendly culture. At the same time, having a very clear focus on, you know, serving our clients, mm -hmm. right? So we have to keep our culture intact. So we've been very careful in terms of who we talk to, how do we bring them in, how do we get them on board and into our training, what kind of work that we do. So majority of our people are very happy working with EY. It's primarily because the type of profile of work they do. Mm -hmm. So we did a uh, survey for ourselves within our, uh, our employees and, hey, what are the three most important things for you? I would be surprised. I was surprised, particularly if I guess I thought salary would be the first thing, <laughs> right? Uh, but they said, like, you know, one of them, uh, to the start of the conversation, they said, like, the first thing that they would really like to get is the ability to express the, part, yes, the, 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 the opportunity to upskill, uh, yes, work on advanced stuff, and next comes salary, and the third comes work, work like balance, right? These are three things our. So our the ability to learn still exists, that how do, they, how do I up my game? Correct. That is what the first priority is. Yeah. So think about, think about the mentality, right? Uh, that's fantastic. That's the positive mentality one we need to have, right? It's about the, uh, we have a very good, uh, quick learners, particularly. So that computer. helped you build it? Yeah, it helped mm -hmm. build, us, build us a massive scale. Mm -hmm. It's also about not just uh, filling a capacity. Mm. It's about going into the market and helping sell stuff, right? So we have been working with our broader EY ecosystem and uh, giving them the confidence that we can do this work as well. And we can do this at a much an excellent way compared to others mm. and build a track record of that while delivering through the track record. And you get a lot of, you know, through success, success will bring in a whole lot of Absolutely. You know, people together. Raghu, again, we covered so much, uh, I think, a one-hour podcast isn't enough to cover the kind of knowledge you have, especially when it comes to EY GDS. I want to completely cover regions now. Mm -hmm. I think GDS expands everywhere, yeah. right? Yeah. So I want to know, we talked America. Most of stuff and context was in American context. I want to know what's happening in Europe yeah. uh, from a GDS perspective. I want to know, you know, Far East to be Japan, Australia maybe. Then we could talk a little bit of India, uh, other regions in this uh, place, and Middle East and Africa as well. Absolutely, absolutely. So one, um, almost close to a majority of our work actually comes from Americas, but we have a very strong presence in Europe and we help a very good strong clientele in Europe as well as in the APAC region, which we, these are the two major areas that we have. Now, if you look at Europe uh, and APAC, the diversity on that is amazing. Right, yes. the amount of languages. It's just like actually like the states in India. Yes, itself, absolutely. Right? Very different. You go cultures. from one state to another, that's the same thing. The culture is different, food yeah. is different, everything is different. And the way of buying is also different. Yes. So we we have uh, our we have a very strong presence in Poland and okay. also we have a very strong presence in Malaga, Spain mm -hmm. from a global delivery services mm -hmm. standpoint. But EY as a whole, as an office, is pretty much in all of these countries. Mm -hmm. Right. And we help every single 
organization and the client out there. And and uh, in technology and in in the overall business, they follow a lot. Like in terms of okay, they, they let the American companies innovate and do, and then European companies are a little slow to adopt. Now we have started working with them in a global organization a lot more, right? So we are engaging with a lot of companies in Italy, France. Uh, Germany has been always a good spot for in us. Manufacturing, Switzerland, right? Switzerland. Yeah, in every single every industry thing. that we can okay. we can think of. Well, UK is a huge adopter, but the broader Europe is is an area that we have started working a, a lot. It's a great opportunity, though. It's a great opportunity. So everything again, manufacturing, healthcare, Correct. same line of Correct. businesses, same line all of verticals businesses. are changing. But Europe has a lot more regulations compared. Lot to more than America. More than America, because they, for example, they were the first one to put the AI Act. Oh, yes. I've read about this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Artificial Little Insect. And they want to take a lead on that. So today, any organization that is adopting AI should be having adopting a responsible AI. So we are helping a lot of companies in terms of how do you actually go? Who else is best equipped to do that, right, other than EY, in terms of getting them onto the onboard on a responsible AI platform, right? So that's an area that we are helping. Mm -hmm. Now, very similar to that is in your APAC region. APAC, again, even more than the EMEA, what we have found is in APAC, a lot more diversity, right? Uh, you know, language-wise, culture-wise. Here, culture is a way, way, way off between Japanese to Koreans to uh. Chinese to like Singapore, Malaysia to the Australia market. A lot of difference, right? And we work with all of them in, in different capacities. So think about as 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 a uh, as a globally serving company, right? I mean, I wake up at seven o'clock and I have like fifty <laughs> emails from the Australia yeah. guys waiting for me to wake up, right? And then the you know we get into the European market and the America wakes up at like four thirty five o'clock in the evening and we continue through that. Our folks here are like well equipped to balance that. This is why I call you GDS as a syndicate. Like the true value is operating like a consulting company within a consulting company. Yes. Ability to take the learnings that we are getting from, let's say, the Australia market and apply that in the Europe market, right? So that's the value add that we can offer. An outside-in value add in terms of what we see from others and provide that value. That's very hard to get, right? So each market buys differently. They operate differently. They have different regulations. They have very different uh, uh, needs in the, in the market, particularly, for example, let's take a look at it. Some of the Americans who came come in here to India, and we we have visitors almost every week. They look at our uh, the way that we buy stuff, like using our UPI and Paytm yeah, yeah. and stuff. They they just blow. <laughs> That's off game their changing, head. right? There's game no changing. cards. <laughs> the amount of peer to peer and payments yeah. modernization that the eastern part of the world has done, the West hasn't caught up to it. Yeah, so because they're not, quite used to a system that they had built. Still, right? And West is, West, probably for most part, West has done a lot and East has been following. Yes. But for this side oh, of yeah. this stuff, that's, that's well said. We have we have done a massive, on the East side, I've done a massive undertaking. So, so they like the innovation. Oh, they yeah. love it. They love it and they're like questioning, like, why is it not there, right? Of course, they got Venmo and a few other things, right? But uh, but it's not up to the uh, scale I know what of you mean. what we do. I know what you mean. They appreciate the fact that this is very fast. Uh, no hassle. Yeah, no hassle. It's your phone. It's your personal <laughs> computer right there. You go to a sugarcane vendor. Yeah. You just QR code. A QR code, and the, half of the time, the nowadays I'm looking at the vendors. Don't even check it. They're like, okay, it's done. <laughs> you can, you can yeah. go. Right. I mean, the convenience. Yes. The amount of convenience. And the next thing that they are thrilled is our the the door to door delivery aspects. That today the ten minute you know, delivery. How the east oh, yeah. market. Has, has been able to take uh, the unique opportunity that they have every problems that they had in terms of traffic, in terms of fuel consumption, in terms of, uh, and they put the labor advantage that we have and turn the market around. They're looking at it and saying, wow, I mean, like, you know, this is a unique case, right? Where it's, they might adopt or they might not adopt. So they like the processes. They want they to look love, at the tech, the they processes. They love the process and, and they love the fact that India, or at least, uh, at least India particularly, as being able to build that network okay. on which you could transform that 1.8 billion people. Absolutely. That. that is a massive undertaking. For anything of this to happen in any other country, it's literally impossible, mm -hmm. right? So they, there's a lot of... So learnings. they learn of scale, they like here. Yeah. Okay. Scale. So when it comes to scale, the mm -hmm. east part of it is where the scale is and uh, systems and applications and uh, solutions are able to operate at that scale which yes. is probably not needed there. So they're learning a lot from that aspect. Okay. In terms of customer service, mm -hmm. we are learning a lot from, from, from I mean, I uh, this part of the world is learning a lot from the West side of it. So each region 
provides a different unique perspective. And we are centrally located, and uh, the advantage for us is ability to understand that broader perspective. Mm-hmm. So our people, our talent, is able to understand and come up with a full round of 360-degree view of like how the world functions, right? So that's the unique you know, perspective of people. Which is what leads me to the next question. You as a leader, different time zones, how do you manage your time in Australia at one yeah. time, and then the Americas, then Europe? How do you keep yourself it's so diffi- fresh because you are so fit? It's it's so difficult one, but we got to recognize that there is uh, this is not going to stop. We don't we have very less power over. Everything. We can't suddenly bring these countries together <laughs> <laughs> geographically <laughs> together, right? It's impossible. So we can't be everywhere anytime. So how do you manage this? It's very leader? important that me and my team and I advocate this a lot to my team as uh-huh. well in terms of keeping ourselves very fit. So, for example, when I wake up every morning, today I don't even look at the phone. I know that there are tons of emails and tons of things that I have to address. Very well said again. It is important, but we are the only person for our family, right? I mean, uh, you know, EY has so many people, but we are the only one for yeah. our family. So it's important to keep ourselves fit. So in terms of I, I take the time, like I take one, uh, one hour and a half to actually hit the gym in our association. And either run or weight trainings and whatnot at a certain age you have to do all this <laughs> to keep them that carries me through the day right uh, that dopamine which gives me that kind of a positive mindset through the day right and keeps me running through the course of the entire right. day so that is very important and we create uh, the same culture within the organization as well we have whatsapp groups in terms of like you know hey uh uh, publishing it, self propagate, like you know, uh, marketing. That's a good bit. culture. But that puts a little bit of peer pressure in terms of okay, you know what? I'm sitting in the couch and watching something. <laughs> like this guy is actually running like a 5k. Uh, you know, maybe I should just at least start walking, right? So I think it brings in a certain level of culture. So one important thing which we have learned is uh, surround yourself. Okay, Raghu, you gave me your thoughts on fitness, but I want to know the organization level. You briefly touched upon the fact that you create groups and you motivate others to start. But at the organization level, I think there's a lot of it today where people talk about fitness. We are, we are, as an organization, EY, GTS, EY as a whole, has it's been very comprehensive in, in this, right from start to end. Let's say like, not just the physical fitness, it's about the mental, mental fitness, fitness as well. And fitness uh, and help at, at the time that's needed. For example, during even COVID, uh, we provide a whole lot of support programs to them. Now, on a day-to-day fitness level, there are organized efforts. Like, for example, there is a carnival, yeah. fitness carnival that I we are starting off fitness. right now and will go on a month. And there are every, let's say every month, we have something or other in terms of like a 10K journey. Uh, Marathon. Uh, yeah, marathons. And bringing people together and that while sometimes not all of them are actually, you know, <laughs> fully fit and running, but, but rather it brings the team together, right? And gives that, seeds the thought in the mind that fitness is so important for them, right? And uh, that's the core culture. So so it's baked within the core culture of the entire organization. How itself. transformative is that for an organization, mental fitness, physical fitness? It is it is huge in a way because um, I think we need, we need healthy people. Mm-hmm. We need happy people. Right, and that's we, a key word. Yeah, healthy and happy, and they are the only ones who will be productive people. Right, so it's not always about like okay, work and tasks and stuff. It's about, it's about like are they really care for them? Right, do we really care for our folks? And uh, and uh, thinking about like you know they are human beings here. Right, first before they are employees, yeah. they are human beings, and working with them in that capacity to really change communities. Right, that is the key aspect of it because when we do a step further. It is, it is what they're going to do with their own families as well, right, and their own society. So we are careful about all of these stuff. And we are, as an organization, it really cares about. There's a tremendous amount of investments yeah. being poured into each one of those. All of those takes a lot of uh, Effort, funds, yeah. funds and money and care and time. So all of this is... No, it's good to have leaders like you who set this context that you're not only proving to others that I'll be fit, I will, I will do this because I want my team to perform. And then you also pass on the fact that the organization allows them to stay fit as well. And like I said, health, health and wellness today are, you know, you have to be human. Uh, but I hope people appreciate it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. This is contagious. It is okay. contagious. That's good <laughs> it, to know. It is. It is. It infects. Mm-hmm. Okay, this uh, this health fitness mentality actually infects people. And it, they get used to it. Once it becomes a habit, uh, actually, then mm. they become the advocates for it. That's so as an organization, we have transformed a lot. In, in Not just the business of, side, but the yeah, cultural yeah, side as well. Correct. Good to know. Now the learning, which is yes. very important. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, people read newspapers, get scared. 
it, you know what I'm talking about. But, uh, it's the elephant in the room. It's AI. Yeah. Yeah. Now they talk about Gen AI. So, yeah. You know, for me, it was always about data. It was about tools Correct. helping you to build things faster. Uh, how should uh, people watching this, uh, people who are working in their 40s, 50s maybe, and people who are graduating now, look at AI as a subject? No, AI for all purposes, AI is the magic of this moment, hmm. right? We are all, we got to appreciate the fact that we live in this era hmm. where AI is, is making a profound impact. Hmm. It's only going to help human beings, right? As, as the end of the day, as an employee as well. The way I see it is AI is not going to displace a person, a human. It is about, still it's going to be about competition is going to be between humans and humans, but who got a better AI? Okay, with, so it's about like how fast you as a person can adopt AI can use AI because today the Gen AI, while the AI has been for a while, mm. why is Gen AI be able to make such an impact in the last one year? It's because AI has been democratized to the point yes. that every single person, regardless of your grandfather to grandma to parents to kids to everybody, can now use AI in some capacity because it's democratized in that fashion. So it's it's, a, it's as a as an employee. As a as a student, uh, as a as anybody out there right now, we should think about how can I actually understand this? How can I be part of this journey upfront? Right. So we as an organization, we have taken a goal of almost training every single person in EY mm -hmm. on foundational AI skills and courses, and it's already off the way. So most of it can be regardless of what level of the, in the organization they are. They can come and join. So today there are 400,000 people mm -hmm. in, the, in EY, almost close to 400,000. Every single person will be trained in AI. And we are already on the way, on the on the march towards it. And we are working on it. Mm -hmm. And people are getting trained and getting certified. And there are massive undertaking on the side. And we as a firm has invested billions and billions of dollars already mm -hmm. on the overall creating this you know structure for, for the organization. And there is a platform called ey.ai, mm -hmm. which is our internal platform, where which is again an LLM based. Like it's a, it's yeah. an LLM based platform. LLM based. So okay. we don't want, I mean, you don't want your company documents to be put in chat GPT and stuff, right? So ey.ai gives you that opportunity to do everything that the the, the external uh, uh, platforms provide within the confines this of is the, very in a firewall of the, our organization. So our employees can take advantage of all of mm -hmm. this. So training is a core aspect of it. And AI in cloud and cybersecurity. These are three areas we are counting on as the technologies of the current and the future. Okay. And we have been massively training. Beyond this, it's very important, not just technology, our people have to be domain trained, differentiation. Right like today, when they work with a banking client, insurance client, they have to understand what is banking, what is insurance. So those domain training certifications we provide a lot. On top of all of the stuff, people also love certifications. So I heard you do boot camps for these. Boot camps we have uh, with the Halt University. Mm -hmm. We have an MBA program. So we, it's, it's a massive program and a lot of interest from our employees in terms of how can I get an MBA. Today with EY, you can get an MBA while you're working and the firm sponsoring it. Mm. Right, so that's a huge advantage. Do a lot of the engineers get to become uh, consultants, consultants, uh, strategic and advisors, MBA, yeah, advisors, and with a degree. Oh, interesting. Right, with the post That's a good move. Yeah. So within the organization. Within the organization. So. And even within the organization, while it's not a... So we have programs within the organizations which will allow you to move within the organization itself. See, majority of the times what happens is people leave because they think that's a dead end. Hmm. Right? What we're telling them, there's no dead end. You can actually move to a different part of the organization and continue to provide service and upskill yourself. Hmm. So that structure is also established within UI. So... Oh, people can move within the organization. They actually go can go travel mm. to US, UK, wherever we deploy. Mm. So a lot of opportunity. How do you reskill yourself again? I'm coming back to it because, yeah. like you said, I you're physically fit, mentally fit, but you also tell your people that look, I at my level, I'm reskilling. Correct. Does that happen? It's absolutely because yeah. it's all about foundations, right? Naturally, it, it's all about like how do you get the foundation right? Mm -hmm. All of these new technologies, new skills, it's about if you get the foundation mm -hmm. right, it's going to be really fast and getting yes, yourself absolutely. Like skilled. Absolutely. Right? So over the course of number of years, it does help me. And mm -hmm. I'm sure like uh, that's my ask to everybody in our team. Yes. Get your foundations right. Okay. Get your foundations right. The un about technologies keep changing. and I will. It's inevitable. Change will happen. Technologies will come. 
every now and then there's something getting released. But if you get your foundations right, yeah, you can get to yourselves uh, adapted to that. Really, really okay. Fast. What would you advise young graduates who always want to work with EY? I mean, there are, anyway, I know a lot in the past accountants and everybody wanted to get to EY, but today there's a technology opportunity as well, right? How do you recommend these young technologists who want to be part of the EY GDS? Uh, who are probably entering 12, past 12th and getting into the first year of graduate school. And do you think that they should learn these technologies uh, and have their foundational elements right? Because anyway, you're going to train them. Correct. But what should they do in the first year of uh, college uh, to get to a place like EY? So we, we, when we when we hire from campus, today we go to the campuses mm -hmm. and we hire a lot of people from campus. Mm -hmm. When we hire them for the first two years, we give, we give them a free field. We, we actually let them work in different capacities within the organization. We are not going to say, hey, you are, I'm going to put you into, you don't know anything about it, I'm going to put you in cybersecurity, you're going to be a cybersecurity yeah. analyst. We're going to give them an opportunity in cybersecurity. They're going to work in digital, they're going to work in data, they're going to work in cloud. We, after a year, period of a year, we ask them, what do you like? What is, what is your passion? What do you think that your natural affinity and skills align to? I mean, we give them as a, as a, as a career. So that's the difference between giving you somebody a job versus giving somebody a career path, right? So, so that's the culture focused. that's set in. Correct. You is very focused in terms of giving people a career Good path, to know. not just a job. The job is a transaction, <laughs> right? And a career path. That, that is over. Organization. Yeah. No, that's great. Uh, so you would say don't fear AI, embrace it. Absolutely. That's great. So final question. Uh, what inspired you to be who you are? Um, say to be a different when you were a child, maybe when you were a teenager, maybe. And all the way up till now, what inspired you? Books, movies, music? Number of things, number of things. I, I was never a huge uh, uh, book reader, but okay. I had read few books. Okay. Um, Grit, for example, okay. is a, it's a good, good, good book, uh, uh, Angela Duckworth. Yes. Uh, it, it gives you, tells you the, the power of uh, having the grit and the perseverance, uh, of how, you can, yes. how you can uh, break all challenges and mm. come up. So I come from a very humble background. Uh, so it took for a number of years and uh, uh, to break through the trust and 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 come up right. So there is a fire in the belly. Mm -hmm. Okay, that is the key. Mm -hmm. The moment you have the fire in the belly and you're never uh, you're not satisfied with whatever you currently are, you, yeah. you know you continue to strive towards excellence. Right? Today you are something. You need to better yourself up next. So I'm not going to compare with anybody else, but rather I can't. For myself as a mm -hmm. comparison and grow. Right? How that's, do you relax? That's a month. Music. Okay. Uh, so Any I'm particular? Huge fan of huge fan of Le Raja. Yeah, uh, same music. here. Same here. Huge, yeah, huge fan of some of the so records, music, out pop songs, uh, out uh, in the radios as well. So, uh, Le Raja is a huge thing, right? Yeah, so he's a great inspiration for generations of Indians. It's evergreen, yeah. right? Uh, it's something that I can continue to hear every day. <laughs> it doesn't make it higher yes. of the songs, right? So. I enjoy that. That's just very important. Music is so important. Either you play music mm -hmm. or you hear music. It's so important to... Yeah, it's very meditative, isn't it? Yeah, it's very meditative. Uh, so that's something that I lean towards. I spend a lot of time with uh, my kids. Mm -hmm. How old are they? Uh, my, my son is uh, 18. Mm -hmm. He's uh, heading to the college this year. I have two daughters uh, who are 12 and 11. They must uh, be keeping you busy. They're like handful. <laughs> they're handful, right? So, and uh, my wife is a homemaker. And uh, after my third child, she she quit, she quit her work and focused she, on yeah. the house. Family is important. Family. No wonder you keep saying yeah. family is important. Yeah, also. it's so important. Without that support, hmm. uh, I don't think we can perform well. So, it's very important to get uh, the balance, <laughs> the work and life balance is so good, which is where I think, I mean, EY offers you that. Right? Mm -hmm. I, I feel very happy about that aspect from when it comes to EY. It's just regardless of whatever levels and stress and tension, you have the right level of balance. And they look at it from that perspective and say, how do you, the mental fitness uh, kind of, yeah. you know, um, efforts that the, the, the organization provides is all towards that. How do we ensure that like our employees are not just happy at work, but also happy outside work? Yeah, that's right? important. Yeah. Right, that sets the perspective to this. Thank you so much, Raghu. Oh, absolutely. Looking forward to having you again. Absolutely. Thank you. Yep.